Okay, so how how the two sessions? Am I turned on? Yeah. Uh, how the two sessions uh, fit in is is uh, Joey talks about outlining and sort of structuring your thesis, and then one of the sections that we focus on is writing a lit review as a part of the thesis. So I'll talk about the lit review part first, and then Jody, when she comes, will be able to to uh, go into the outlining and structuring part of it. So. Um, Typically, every thesis has a literature review as a part of it, um, and different, there's different reasons that you write the lit review. So I'm just going to grab my slides from back here. Um, all right, so in this, in this session, we're going to talk about sort of connecting the literature review to your argument, um, sort of how to, how to structure it, how to look at how the pieces fit together, um, and avoiding maybe some of the common traps that you run into in writing the literature review. So by the end of the session, we're hoping that uh, you'll be able to clarify the purpose of a lit review. You'll know sort of why you're writing it, why you're being asked to do it, how it fits in. Uh, identify the structure and features of a literature review and apply some strategies for planning, organizing and writing your literature review. So what is a literature review? Um, can anyone give me sort of a quick definition for what, what you see it as or how it's been explained to you before? What is a literature review? It's, it's sort of a concise uh, a write up of what the knowledge is already out there um, based on the broader topic of our. Right. So, a concise outline or write up of what is already out there based on, and sorry, I've managed to maintain most of that, but <laughs> based on um, what's already been written about it. So, yeah. what, you, what you can see in the writing. So, what's been published, what's been written about it. Okay, so a summary and an explanation of that complete and, uh, and current state of knowledge on a specific topic. So the idea of the lit review is that you need to know your topic area in order to be able to, to focus and, you know, you could, if you wrote, try to write a lit review on the sort of topic area that we talked about in the research question, that broader sort of area, you know, it could go on forever. You could write books, et cetera, on it. So you're writing it on your specific topic, your fo focus topic with the keywords kind of in mind of, of what uh, comes out of your research question uh, from academic sources, so books, journal articles, and other relevant sources. And it should include a critical analysis of each of the articles. So you're evaluating, you're comparing, you're not just summarizing boom, boom, article after article after article after article. Okay, so it means that you have to understand them, you have to integrate them. So that's the difficult part. Um, if you just had to summarize them, maybe not so bad, but you actually have to bring them all together and allow them to, to talk to each other. So why do we write literature reviews? Uh, the purpose of them, uh, Pascal talked a little bit about that when he was talking about uh, searching for information for literature reviews. So some of this might sort of overlap. So it provides an overview of the existing research on a topic. Uh, expands your knowledge of the topic, so you often do it just to help you understand and read more and learn and prepare your and find your research question. It identifies the arguments of the chosen articles or books, so you start to see what other people have tried to, you know, set up as as the discussion areas, the uh, the points of of research. Uh, evaluates methodological approaches to the topic, so you can find out what methods others have done and what they've said about which ones work, which ones don't work. Assesses the value of each reference for other researchers. So, you know, which ones are more important than others? You know, which ones do you want to focus on in your, uh, in your lit review? Highlights similarities, consistencies, differences, similar or differences and inconsistencies in previous research. So that's part of that analytical aspect of it. And reveals existing gaps in the literature. Okay, so you're trying to find those areas that you can help to fill. So that justifies your own research topic and situate your research within the field so people understand what you're doing and why and how it relates to the broader sort of literature review area. And the main purpose is that it prepares to help you answer your research question. So the things you include in the lit review are the things that will help the reader to understand why you chose to do your particular research question and what they need to know in order to be able to understand your interpretation of results. Yeah? Sorry, this, this may be a really dumb question, but in terms of value of specific literature, we just finished our second residential piece, and a lot of the stuff that we've referred to in the past has been through Harvard Business Review and that type of thing through the business piece. And in class, the prof was telling us, that in terms of peer review, most of the Harvard H 
VR stuff isn't peer reviewed. So how credible would that be? And is there an easy way to identify what articles or what journals are peer reviewed? Okay, so yeah, the peer review process, you can often select in the database searches, you can select peer reviewed. So it, that's one way to help to isolate it so that you are just looking at peer reviewed mm -hmm. journals. Um, trying to think in the description of them, whether they would often refer to that. So if you found a journal and went to sort of its web page, it may, might provide the information about that as well. Um, but I know there's a, you know, within the database searches, you can tick off, you know, peer reviewed. So isolate it just to that. Does anyone know any other suggestions, come across anything else that, uh, that helps to identify that? So you're tending to look for the scholarly, the academic sources. So when you get to sort of popular magazines, those kinds of t things, trade journals, then they're often not. Um, but if it's something that's been produced sort of in association with a, a university or an educational institute, then those would tend to be. Um. But that's not to say that your research shouldn't include other sources, because they can be valuable sources of knowledge. So it may not be a peer-reviewed article. It might be a government website. It might be a trade journal that's very specific to your research project. So you have to weigh the pros and cons of authority and peer review, because sometimes we have to step aside from that and look at what else is being published out there. And sometimes that might be, depends what you're doing. If you're doing like truth and reconciliation, some of it might be interviews or, um, I, I don't know, but, but it's not always going to be peer reviewed that you're gonna be pulling into your literature review. And I guess part of the whole lit review piece is, is identifying that it's from a trade magazine and that, that you're trying to um, gather evidence to support that's there. Yeah, so in your, in your write-up of it, in your, in your literature review, then part of what you're doing is letting the reader know where it came from. So if it's important to maybe distinguish that uh, something was from a government report, you can, you can say that in your sentence, you know, in a government report on blah, blah, blah. So that might highlight for the reader that, the reader that okay, that's the kind of source that this is from, you know. Or maybe you do gather sort of... Uh, user comments from a blog because you're talking about you know something to do with usability so but you could distinguish that and say blog comments or user comments were and you know still have the citation and the reference in the list but saying it in the actual text of the lit review would help the reader to go oh, okay so this isn't evident this isn't uh, results of an empirical study this is you know some comments uh, so you can help the reader to understand what kind of source you got it from. And just sort of building from that idea that evaluating, this has methodological approaches, but you're also evaluating what you're reading. And so p perhaps your, that one particular trade journal has a very left-leaning bias or something. That might be part of what you write up in the text about that source. So evaluating sort of the biases or the limitations of that source. Um, can be also very effective for positioning it and contextualizing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so everything doesn't have to be a completely even playing field or equal playing field. Part of what you're discussing is where information came from and how it fits in. So, good question. Okay, so questions that you want to ask when you're researching your topic. Um, and again, I think maybe Pascal sort of alluded to some of these. So what kind of work has been done in the field? So these are things that you're trying to find out as you're doing your reading, as you're doing your, your uh, searching for articles. What kind of work has been done in the field? Who are the big names in the research area? Um, you know, who are the researchers that have published the most, have been cited the most? So Pascal mentioned being able to see from one article, how many times has it been cited since then? So being able to see that, that pathway. Um, and so that'll help to tell you, okay, who are the main researchers? And recognize the names that come up again and again. Uh, what are their contributions to the field? What are the key findings that, that have been shown sort of again and again and confirmed by others? Have there been historical shifts in the field? So that might be something of interest to indicate in your introduction to your, to your thesis or to your lit review. Um, what, are, you know, what are the changes? What, are they, what did they think? And then you know, what has changed to what they, what they know now? Where do researchers agree or disagree? 
Uh, what are the strengths and limitations of each work? So that's part of the critical aspect, too, that you need to recognize that one study was perhaps not as strong as another. You know, sample size, type of methodology they used, um, even their, their way of interpreting their statistics, you know, whatever you can find may help you then to critically analyze how, how well that, that piece of, of research fits in with the other. So maybe you have two contradictory results from two studies, but one was a much weaker study. So that's something you would comment on, and then that lends strength to the one that was a stronger study and you know, did find the results that perhaps agree with yours. Uh, what are the gaps in the existing research? So those are the things that you're trying to key in on because your, your research, your study, is probably going to try to answer that. Okay. And how does your research then contribute to the field? So those are the things you're thinking about. Those are trying to gather notes on, those are the things that you're, you're trying to focus on as you start doing your research for your lit review. Features of lit reviews, so somewhere in there you're going to be identifying the key problems and issues, uh, you're going to be talking about the major findings that have, have come up through, you know, as, as um, trends through the literature that you look at, the main points of view and controversies, critical evaluation, the strengths and the weaknesses and general conclusions about state of research in the field. So that's what you'll be trying to include in your lit review. This is also what you'll see you know, when you're reading published reviews. Right? So some of the articles that you may come upon in your research are going to be, um, <laughs> are going to be, can you get that from Jason? <laughs> are going to be um, review articles. Okay, so you need to recognize that, first of all, that they're not research studies, uh, but that they are themselves review articles, and then be able to sort of see that they've done that. And that may help you when you're first starting to do your topic, is to find a review, good review article and start to see, oh, okay, they've already helped to identify some of these trends. How many have done that, like sort of purposely looked for a published review article in order to kind of help you get started? Has anyone done, done that as a strategy? Okay, good. So quite a few have done that. Um, and so important, you know, you find a title that looks really useful and then you get the article, make sure that you sort of quickly first check, okay, is it a review article or is it a, a research study? Because then you don't want to, you know, you want to recognize that before you start um, considering it as, as the source of information. Um, because you're mostly going to base your lit review on studies and results and the reviews are just going to help to, the re published review articles are going to help to point you to those. Yeah, so you need to know what kind of article you have. So in what situations might you write a lit review? So when have you so far been asked to write a lit review or what are you maybe currently working towards writing a lit review for? What are some of the situations? Introduction of an article? Yeah, so in the introduction of an article, then there's usually a, a mini lit review. Or sometimes in an article there might be a, another section called, what else might it be called? After an introduction in an article, what do you sometimes see? Any, oh. <laughs> there's, a, there's a guy out there with his hand up, but I don't think he was answering the question. Uh, the abstract is summarizes the whole piece, but sometimes you'll see background, right? So you might see a section called background. Uh, so that might be, that's really a lit review, right? That's what you're providing is the background on the topic. So it might be called lit review, it might be called background. Uh, where else have you either seen them or, so we mentioned that there could be a published literature review. So that's another place where you'll see a lit review. Where else? Does anyone, yeah? Most of our papers that we write for our courses, they want literature Okay, so as an assignment for a course, you may be asked to take a topic. It may or may not be your actual kind of final research project. It may be for a specific course. Um, and so you have to find, you find another topic and you do a literature review on that topic. Uh, how many have done an assignment, a lit review as an assignment for a course? A few people, okay. Um, where else? Yeah, so your thesis has a lit review section somewhere within it. The proposal um, probably had uh, a lit, fairly big lit review section in it. Okay, so you'll be working on it and doing it kind of all the way through. 
um, as you do the various sort of parts of it. If you do a presentation for something, you may include, again, sort of a lit review component to that, a background component. So you'll be doing that kind of searching and, and analyzing a lot of the way along. Um, so some ideas here. So you might do it as a way of deciding on a thesis or dissertation project. So we mentioned you could sort of find your topic ideas and that sort of thing by doing the research for it. Uh, assignment for a course, part of a proposal, proposal for grants, grants or funding. So you might have to do proposals there and fill in a lit review section uh, component within it, uh, or you might end up writing a review article for publication later. So lots of different situations where you'd have to include or write a lit review. So in the thesis or dissertation, uh, there may be different places that you see a lit review. And so this, the next slides come from the outlining that you'll see next when Jody does her component. Um, but these, so Jody's going to present to you some ideas for um, thesis mapping templates. So, and she has copies of them, et cetera. Uh, and so for this one, this is, there's the introduction section and then chapters and a conclusion. And so the second, you know, the second section of it, so maybe the first chapter might be in its entirety a literature review. So that could be sort of for arts and humanities, there's a whole literature review chapter. For science or social science, again, the thesis mapping. So there's an introduction section, uh, a theoretical framework possibly, and then a lit review section. And then that might be followed by methods, results, discussion, conclusion. So that kind of structure. And then another type of thesis mapping is uh, where you have each of the chapters is an article. So each of the chapters is kind of an intro materials and methods results discussion that form components, you know, three or four components of your major study. So in that case, you'll have the introduction, and then you might have a literature review section as part of that introduction chapter. But then within each of the study articles or the articles about the, uh, about the research, then you might have, you'll have an introduction and maybe a mini lit review that focuses specifically on that topic. Okay, so different places that you'll see them. Yeah. So ultimately what this is showing is that the lit review falls in different places, in different disciplines, but also within some disciplines, it might fall within different places within dissertations. So sometimes it will be combined with your theoretical review, sometimes it will be teased out and within each chapter, you need to ask your supervisor so this is one of those instances where this is a question or a conversation that you need to have with your committee and your supervisor. Where should I include my literature review? Should it be embedded within specific chapters? Should it be its own chapter? Should it be its own publishable chapter? Because some people will publish their lit review before they include it within their thesis. So these are different questions and conversations to be having with your committee members. In some disciplines, in my own, I come from the English department, we don't even call it a literature review. So you might go to your supervisor and say, well, where should my lit review go? And they might say, I don't really know what you're talking about. <laughs> and, but in my discipline, it's embedded both within the introduction and within the individual chapters, which each have thematic topic concerns. So while we don't call it a literature review, we actually do it. So again, just so you know what it is and its purpose, so that when you have that conversation with your supervisor, you can figure out with them where it should fit. And then going back to my suggestion this morning, when you go to the atrium and you look at other theses and dissertations in your field, look, particularly those approved by your supervisor, look for where the literature review is. So that's where when you're looking at other people's dissertations, you're not interested in content. You're looking for structure and style. Okay. Yeah. And Jody will go through more of these templates uh, so that you'll be able to see it in detail. Okay, so in then searching for writing your and organizing your literature review, you need to remember that research question. So the research question part that we did this morning that's going to feed then into, OK, so if this is my question and I want to find out the effects of this on this, what do I need to provide background information for, for the reader? Okay, so it directly impacts on what you're going to include. So 
some ideas for sort of organizing it. Um, you might create a notebook. So this is a suggestion for a two-sided notebook. One gives a summary of the source, uh, purpose, content details, main points. And then on the other side, you write kind of your interpretations. So this allows for you to, to specifically focus on having that analytical, critical part. So purpose was the purpose achieved that they indicated? Uh, were there any special or unique features of this? Um, is it re relevant or valuable to this field and to my research? So you may get a paper that seems relevant, but you'll see something within it that tells you that it's not. So by making some notes, then when you find that paper again, you know, in three weeks or in six months, and you totally forget that you ever saw that paper before, you can look it up in your notebook and realize, oh, okay, yeah, I already looked at it and thought it was useful and, it fa and found out that it wasn't. So keep track of those notes, you know, sort them alphabetically, et cetera, some way to keep track so that you can save yourself that extra work of finding it later. So then a couple of tables. Sorry, so I just ahead. handed out two sheets of paper. This one here is a single source. And one of the biggest mistakes I made in my dissertation process was I read 100 books for my first qualifying exams and I would read it and I'd put it down. I might make some notes, I might make 20 pages of notes, and inevitably when it came back to writing my dissertation, I had either way too many notes or I couldn't even remember if I had read the book. So one of my suggestions is every time you read something, fill out some sort of source sheet. So this is a template. You can create it however you want. You can create a digital one and attach it to your digital article, however. However you want to do it, find out a way to start gathering your thoughts. So what was the purpose of the study, its main research question, um, any key findings from it, um, what sort of methods were used or maybe theoretical frameworks did they use, um, what were the strengths of this, of, of this article or this study, and what were the limitations. Perhaps they only looked at <coughs> pigs in suburban areas and not in <laughs> Europe. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how that Do even makes sense. Do we have pigs in suburban areas? I don't know. Yeah. Well, we did in Toronto and now yeah. our town is shut down. Uh. <laughs> um, and then finally, how is it, this article or book relevant to my thesis? And so once you, you could do this bullet points however you want, but I highly suggest that you take the time right after you finish reading and make a little summary and put it here somewhere so that when you're going to your literature review and you're starting to pull together sources about the same topics or themes or methodological practices, you already have little sections written up that you can then pull together and it makes the writing process much quicker. So this is a single source sheet. This is a multiple source sheet. So once I've read a whole bunch of articles and maybe all of them are dealing with um, trauma on the brain, I could then create a master list that starts to gather those sources that are dealing with that same theme. So it's a way of organizing what you've read. Good. Um, yeah, so tailor them. Tailor them to the way that works for you. If methods is important, then maybe you specifically want a, uh, want a column on methods. Um, if species and the population is important, then maybe you add a column for that so that you see which ones are on mice, which ones are on pigs, which ones are on et cetera. So whatever is useful to you. Um, and then this was an example of uh, somebody compiling those sorts of notes. So they had citation, theory, the purpose and hypotheses, sample, method, findings, comments, and limitations. Um, so you might have just kind of a point on each. You might have a full sort of description on each, whatever works for you. And I think the one thing that's most useful about this chart here is this final column, because these are her critical thinking. This is her voice. So this is the article. This is how her, it's relevant to her research and future research. So don't forget that you are also uh, um, inserting your critical voice into the literature review. So that last column is very important. Okay. So structuring your literature review. So one of the big questions, because it's often a fairly large paper or section or document, 
um, is how to make it all fit in and how to, f how to fit in the individual studies and make them make sense with each other, how to fit them into sections, etc. So one of the strategies that we're looking at is in terms of showing them as conversations. So looking at the way you talk about the articles and the results and what the author said is as conversations between authors. So dividing into different topics, topic A, B, C, and then what are the similarities and differences between the articles and the studies that looked at those, um, and then what is your, your researcher's contribution or your thoughts about it. So if you're writing it as a lit review, then you're talking about, you're giving your sort of interpretation, your suggestions about which ones were stronger, which ones made sense. In the discussion, there's also kind of a literature review component because you're comparing your results to others. So there's also that opportunity for that conversation, that discussion between studies. And in that case, it's how does it fit in with your actual contribution, your results, your, um, your findings. So grouping conversations and the, uh, I don't know if you've had, okay. So Jody has a handout um, to look at, look at the topics that you, use in your, or that you come up with for your literature review as being conversations about certain topics. So the, the idea is to group the materials, the information that looks at different topics, um, and organize it into these, buff, uh, these uh, dinner tables. So the idea of it being a series of, of dinner tables, and at each dinner table, there's different authors that have come together and are seated there that you've seated together because they're all talking about the same topic. So it kind of gives a framework for thinking about it as not you having to, again, summarize all these articles one by one, but what do the different articles or what do the different authors say to each other about the different aspects of, of that topic? Sorry. Okay. Sorry? Okay. Yeah, you can, no, you can interrupt. <laughs> I was just going to say, so part of the way I teach the literature review is you're going to take me to your banquet hall and you've had to organize the seats. So in my dissertation, I had intergenerational storytelling, one big thematic concern. Trauma studies, another big th thematic concern. And diasporic theory, another big thematic concern. So in your t dissertation, you probably have different thematic concerns. So you're going to take me through your banquet hall, and you're going to walk me by the hand, and you're going to take me and sit me down at the first table. And you're going to tell me, what are they discussing? Where are they agreeing with each other? Where are they disagreeing? What are the, the key conversations that are happening at this table? And what are you saying at the table? How are you contributing to this conversation? How is it relevant to your research? Then you're going to take me by the hand and you're going to walk me to the next table and we're going to sit down and do the same thing. And you have to think about how you organize my walk through the banquet hall with you so that I can follow the development of your thinking. You can't take me to the diasporic theory table first before I introduce you to the big topic. So Lenore's um, starting this morning with what's your big broad topic. Maybe it's important to go to that table first. So this becomes the structure of your literature review. And you can use these tables, these thematic areas, as your, your subheadings for your literature review. And when Jody says, me, take me through, of course, it's the reader, right? Any, yeah. any reader that you, that you have for your literature review, you need to help them figure out how things are connected. And that's the leading through. So you can use this, you can use the, the chart as a way to then start to sort of list the authors once you decide on some groupings or topic areas. Um, you can use this worksheet to then identify the, you know, the major and the minor players within each of them. And it doesn't, just because there's a group and a particular author, that author may not just sit at one table. That author may have something to say about each of the tables. So the authors themselves may end up being repeated at different tables. And so you would talk about what they say about that particular topic area at that table in that section of your, of your paper, and you talk about what they said about the other area in the other one. So again, it's not just kind of paper after paper summarized, it's whatever pieces of that paper were useful to talk about this, and whatever pieces of the papers are useful to talk about something else. Okay. So you're thinking about the connections between the author, 
Um, you're wanting to see them engage in conversation about agreement and disagreement. Some tables may be louder than others, lots of shouting and screaming because they all have different viewpoints. Other tables may be nice and quiet. There's just, you know, everybody's in agreement with it. Uh, some tables may have some loud voices and some quiet voices, so you want to make sure that the quiet voices are also heard if, if their work is significant. Um, so you're thinking of it in terms of those, those people talking. Uh, so logically develop your re review of the overall research area, walking the guests through, seating yourself at the table as well. Yep. One of the challenges with the literature review is figuring out how much do I need to include, right? I've just read 200, 300 books for my dissertation. Ah, my literature review when I first wrote it was like 80 pages long and my committee laughed at me. <laughs> so then you have to evaluate, okay, what really does my reader need to know in order to understand my project? I don't need to necessarily introduce them to the big, huge field. Maybe I need to introduce them to a couple of key players who have shaped the field, but I don't have to introduce them to everything. And you know, this sheet here where I've got this nice little blurb on Smith's article, Maybe Smith and Fred and Bob and Jim and Mary all said the same thing. So maybe I say, the majority of scholars argue blah, 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 and then I lump them all together. And then this little blurb, it's good for my knowledge, but I don't need it in my lit review. So it's evaluating which sources you need to tell your reader about, which ones are key, which ones can be little single line notes, which ones can just go in your bibliography. And that's sort of you evaluating. So important to remember, just because you read it and spent time on it doesn't mean that it's going to end up being useful to you in your lit review. So you may have spent an hour and a half reading the paper, and then in the end, it's not actually useful. So you have to kind of separate yourself from, but I did so much work. I did so much reading. It took so long. It was so difficult. Um, but it may just be a line in the introduction then, eventually. OK? Uh, so contributing to the conversation. So you're going to have some ideas about what makes sense in terms of what the authors are saying. So people in this, in this sort of idea of it think, well, or the question is usually, can I really say my own opinion? Uh, so don't think of it as much as an of an opinion as um, a logical conclusion based on evidence. So you've read maybe six, seven papers, and you can now help the reader say, well, these three agreed on this one results that this did seem to happen when they did this. These others don't, but you know, notice that this one didn't use the same sample size. This one used a slightly different method. This one um, you know, forgot to include this one step in the, in the process. So your opinion is that these ones are probably make more sense than these, but you're expressing it as a logical conclusion based on exactly what you're, you've presented to the reader. Okay, so it's not a random opinion just out of the blue. It's logical. So you're going to analyze the strengths and limitations based on what you've read, not just thoughts. Um, and explain how these conversations contribute to your thinking about your topic and your research questions. So depending on the use of the lit review, if it's an assignment for a course, um, you, know, you may or may not have a specific research question that they've asked you to look at, you're, you know, depending how they gave you that, that, uh, that assignment or that topic area. If it's going to be a part of your thesis, if it is relevant to your to your research, then that's where knowing your research question and being able to connect the lit review to it is going to be important. So you're still always thinking about that research question and make sure, again, that the reader knows why that table is there. If it doesn't seem to really connect or it's too broad or it's too, you know, um, can't think of the word, too, <laughs> I'm going blank. Uh, that table is just uh, irrelevant, then you get rid of the table and you don't talk about it anymore. So the seating plan, you're thinking about what order of conversations would help the guests understand the overall research area. So there's a couple of different ways that you can think about organizing and we'll talk about those in a minute, but what I wanted to have you do was take a minute to just brainstorm now based on your research question that you identified this morning, or as far as you could get in that sort of ref refinement of the, of the, the specific topic, um, think about what topic areas you're going to need for your lit review. What kinds of topic areas are you going to need to research and present to the reader in order to help them understand 
what's important for your research question. Okay, so take a minute uh, right now and just try to identify some of those topic areas. What are you going to be researching or what have you already been researching in the literature to help you understand and then eventually to help your reader understand. Okay, so jot down as many as you can think of. They can be broad, they can be narrow, but just what are those topics that you can think of. Okay, so keep that list, you know, use it, build on it. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about kind of a couple of different ways that you can think of organizing. So then you're going to start to try to apply that to your, to your brainstorming list. You're also going to slowly work through when you look at your research question and get it further developed. Some of those topics will go, some others will be added, but it'll help you then figure out, okay, where are my, what are my keywords, what am I going to be searching for based on the stuff that Pascal talked about, um, how, how are you going to find information about that. All right, so we're going to go through these fairly quickly just because we're uh, short on time and wanted to let Jody get to the, uh, to the outline fairly soon. So two ways that you can think about in terms of organizing topics, and they talk about them as natural or artificial. Um, natural are things that are, are ways that there's sort of a term to describe them. So chronology is time sequence, right? So sometimes background information, that sort of thing is given in chronology. Location or spatial, maybe your topic has some geographic elements, so you're talking about things that happen in this country versus this country versus this country. Parts of the body, you know, could be location, spatial, if you're talking about things that way. Others are processes, so, you know, certain processes, how they happen. Uh, next process, how it happens. Artificial are more, maybe it's more often that your main topic areas are going to have to be that way, because you're going to have to talk about this, and then the reader's also going to have to know about this, and also have to know about this. So we have some examples just to sort of set this up for you that, um, you know, if you take a quick look at this one, would you say that's a natural structure or an artificial structure? Natural because it's based on chronology, right? So they've gone through it one by one. Whereas this one then, they've got major political parties, minor, defunct, fringe. So it's not a natural, it's an artificial that's been imposed, different types of political parties. Uh, this one, review of issues, what's that, natural? Natural because it's based on geography, spatial. And then this one, though, review of current technology, wildlife contraception, bio biologic and economics, so different topic areas that are needed, but there isn't really a, uh, there isn't a chronology, there isn't a sp uh, spatial aspect to them, so it's an artificial structure. So you can find out whether your discipline uses one or the other. Um, the purpose statement, and I mentioned this morning that the review question will eventually end up being a purpose statement in your introduction. So the question was, what are the effects of blah on blah? Your purpose statement is the purpose of this thesis was to uh, determine the effectiveness of blah over blah. Um, transitional statements through the literature review help to tell the reader how these different sections are connected. Headings. Headings are important in lit reviews, so you may have written papers before that didn't use headings at all, but now you know, focus on it for lit review, you definitely can. Um, take into account things like chronology or methodology or other structures that you can impose within your lit review. So maybe within a topic area, you can, you can refer to something in terms of chronology. So the patterns can be overall, but then also within each of the sections that maybe some of those structures. Uh, so the purpose statement, this is just an example of a purpose statement. Uh, purpose of this review is to provide an overview of issues relating to the use of contraceptive agents, particularly in North America, as a means of resolving human wildlife conflicts. In the manuscript we discuss, and then they identify the, the sections or the topic areas. Uh, compounds currently and previously used to control fertility, the regulatory pathways for gaining approval, uh, health and safety concerns, and public perceptions on the use. So they've identified in the purpose statement the actual sections that they're going to talk about. And that's something that you can do for your reader. And whenever you introduce um, something in a list, follow that, mirror that order throughout the dissertation. So if I introduce in the introduction A, B, C, and D, the literature review should follow the order A, B, C, and D, and my discussions should follow the order of A, B, C, and D because you set up an expectation for your reader. So whenever you set an order, follow it, mirror it throughout. So I'm going to offer this as a suggestion when you go away. You can then start to try as you get towards that stage of your, of your lit review to draft your purpose statement 
uh, to identify what categories you're going to discuss based on the brainstorming list that you worked on, and then try to organize them into an outline of headings and subheadings, so that banquet series of banquet tables. Okay, so think about that. That'll be your next exercise to do kind of when you leave here, um, depending on how close you are to, to formulating that topic and that research question. Reporting styles, the slide just suggests the different ways that you can talk about the research. So there's some suggestions there for how you integrate the author names into it. So don't be afraid to mention the author's name in the sentence. You don't, everything doesn't have to just be information and then reference, information and then reference. Talk about who did it and, and what they did and how <coughs> and, and why, et cetera. So then next slide two, examples of what sometimes students do, which is in each of these paragraphs, we see that they've mentioned a study. So Smith, 2008, says this. Jones and Johnson do this. Romero suggests this. So that's that idea of just summarizing individual studies and, and information about it. Instead, you want this kind of paragraph, where they have, obviously, a number of references throughout it, and the information that's talked about, you know, the sort of topic area, what they found about it, who agreed, so French, 1998, and Heron, 2000, so we've got some agreement there. You had to figure that out. You read, you read <coughs> French and you read Heron, and you decided that they both agreed on a certain aspect of it. So this is what you're doing for your reader, and providing transitions like however and moreover, so the reader can see how these things agree and how they, how they relate to each other. Okay, so that's the kind of integration you want, rather than individual. Um, we had an exercise, but within the time that we, um, uh, the original one and a half hours that we usually do, so it's, I'll cut that out. Um, weaknesses in the sources, again, a few word, types of wording, that language that you can use to talk about uh, how sources didn't maybe do a particular aspect that they should have. Paragraph structure, um, just keeping in mind the idea that within your paragraph you want to identify the main point, provide some proof, and identify the significance. And we've got an example of that uh, with just identifying what those sections are. So again, in the interest of time, we'll just leave that for you to look at. Problems with research or with lit reviews, uh, that there might not be a central guiding component to it, so your research question might not be refined enough, uh, that the articles might, some of them might be irrelevant, so make sure you're not just including them because you looked them up. Um, missing the analysis, you've just been summarizing, so make sure you're doing that critical analysis. They're not integrated or synthesized, and you haven't indicated what your conclusion is about them. Um, it's not logical, the development of ideas isn't clear, so make sure you include the headings and the transitions. Um, and that you maybe misinterpret or distort information or uh, inflate some information that, that some results that weren't as important and you minimize the others. So make sure that you're ethical and that you read the sources carefully and interpret um, accurately. Um, and that, of course, you want it to be written carefully and concisely, so edit it carefully. Okay.